Greetings, everyone. Hi, I'm Jay Tucker, the Executive Director for UCLA Anderson Center for Management of Enterprise and Media Entertainment and Sports. And if you're here, you know that this is when we have interesting and inspiring, hopefully, conversations talking about the business of entertainment, business of sports, uh, and beyond. I'm really thrilled today to be sitting down with Peter Seidler, who's chairman and lead investor for the San Diego Padres, not only um, because of all the great things we're going to be able to talk about with respect to what's happening with the sport, with the club, what's going on, but also because at heart, I'm a huge baseball fan myself, and I could talk for days just about the sport. So Peter, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Very happy to be here. Um, should I make some opening remarks? Please. All right. Well, I'm going to put my glasses on. Um, but first of all, I'm delighted to be here. I, I graduated from Anderson School in 1988. And um, shortly after that, I, I previous I pre I graduated with a finance degree from University of Virginia, got a job at Bank of America, and I was a lender into private businesses and in, and in some extent just buyouts. And so I learned how that game works and it was completely different in the late 80s, early 90s than it is now. And the fact of the matter was, if you could find a good company, you could buy it as, as long as people believed in you and you could do it with other people's money. Um, and I knew that and I, and I learned, had learned how to find deals through kind of the business bro broker community which was tiny compared to what it is today, especially on small deals. Investment banks wouldn't touch it. And, but there, were, there was kind of a growing cottage industry of brokers that could really find the good deal, the entrepreneur that wanted to sell his business or um, you know, fast growing businesses that needed capital to support their growth. So I started my own firm and in 91, 92, 93 and 94, about one business per year, just by myself. And, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, I, I learned a lot of lessons in the 1991 deal. I don't even talk about it anymore. Um, basically struggled just to get our money out after a, after a long battle. The, the big lesson learned was do business with good people, people you trust, people that are competent. What we talk about at the Padres now, stolen from Al Davis a little bit, is commitment to continuity and excellence. So, you know, the Raiders were always commitment to excellence and of course, just win baby. But, um, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get to the Padres in a second, but, you know, all in all, it was a really good lesson, the 1991 deal, the 1992 deal I still own. It's been a great ride. Um, 93, we sold probably just two years ago. That was a great ride. And 1994 deal, um, still own. So, you know, that was the benefit of doing deals then when you would do them one at a time. And if you got a good one, you just keep it, you know, pay down the debt or, um, you know, do what's best for the company, basically. And I always did it in partnership with the management team. Yeah, um, generally with the founding entrepreneur as well. And it's worked out well. And, you know, just again, going back to state the obvious, the, the big lesson I learned in the first, I knew in my gut the guy was a bad guy, you know, for lack of a, you know, nuanced description, just he was a bad guy, I couldn't trust him. And in any event, um, it's really um, informed all of my business decisions going forward. I remember when at one point, you know, some wise old uh, business guy said, Peter, you can't take business personally. Um, you know, you got to be cold and measured and analytical. And I remember waking up the next morning and saying, that's just not me. I take business personally. It motivates me. It, um, and, you know, people are there. You know, one business lesson I also learned over the course of time is you have to know what kind of animal you are in a jungle because you can be a really successful giraffe or elephant or mountain lion, but you can't be all three. And that, that's what, you know, from the early nineties through um, all of the nineties, uh, the decade of the two thousands. And then um, until I bought the Padres um, was a consistent theme and talking about doing business with people you trust 
Um, the second uh, person to work with for me was, or with me was my younger brother, who's five years younger. And now our youngest partner, I'm, I'm from a family of 10. And I saw my 87 year old mom today, which was a delight. Outstanding. Um, but my youngest brother is 19 and a half years younger than me. He's a partner with our firm now. And he's way better than myself or my brother Bob ever could have thought about being, as are the other partners. We have nine total partners now. Um, so, you know, life intervenes, right? In my early 30s, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And um, that changed things. You know, I wasn't a force of energy all the time. It takes a while to learn how to manage that whole disease, which I did, and I'm very disciplined about it. But by the time um, 2010 really rolled around, and, and you know, we converted our business from a one at a time deal shop to a traditionally managed, you know, two percent, twenty percent carried interest private equity fund, and um, we've now very successfully raised, I think, nine. Um, lower middle market funds. Our first one was 55. Our last one was 800. And then we started one a couple of years ago in Sydney, Australia, which has been a big success. Um, uh, a few years ago, and we'll put our second fund together in, in Australia, which is really a hotbed of entrepreneurs with not a lot of means for them to get capital. Um, so private equity wise, we, we certainly know what kind of animal we are in a jungle. Um, we are definitely not the most type A firm. Um, I've never, for me, it never made sense to say, I'm kicking ass. I've done three all-nighters in a row. You know, our firm has a culture where if there's a deal that we need to work on, we'll go all night long, of course. But, you know, I want happy people working at the firm, I, you know, to the extent they want to. I want them to have a family life and, um, you know, we do our best to work smart, as, as smart as we can, but maybe not, you know, stretch every, you know, ounce out of us physically, um, because I just don't think it pays off in the long run. It's certainly not for me. But life intervened again for me in, uh, well, I was a single man in, until like 2009. I got married in my late 40s. And, you know, we were trying to have kids, but it, it, never happened but one day uh, my wife uh, woke me up and she had the positive test and they're like holy shit game on so that that was in 2012 um and then i i went for a checkup at my doctor's and then i was going to pick up my wife to see if we're going to have a boy or a girl and i took out my shirt and my doctor said you've got a mass in your liver so i had a i had stage four non-hodgkin's lymphoma they took me right into chemo. I called my wife and said, uh, call me when you get back. Let me know what kind of, if we're going to have a boy or a girl, um, but I'm not going to be there. And ultimately, um, I ended up in intensive care at UCLA um, because I had, I had a really bad reaction to the chemo. And like the doctors and nurses were coming into my room in ICU like in astronaut suits because yes, yes, I, yes. You know, I, I couldn't get any, any kind of an infection. But a couple of days later, I recovered pretty quickly. And the night one of our friends took my wife into the hospital, they let me go. It was right downstairs. I think the ICU was on the sixth floor and the maternity wing was on the fourth floor. So it was right down the elevator. I walked in, saw my first daughter get born. <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was, you know, like I've told the story before, you know, I, so I don't get tears anymore, but it was great. Um, but the chemo for me was, you know, you got to stay at home because they blasted me hard. And then I heard the Padres were going to be sold. And, you know, I grew up around uh, baseball. My grandfather owned the Dodgers. He moved the team from Brooklyn to uh, Los mm -hmm. Angeles, my uncle took it over, all the great history there, but our family sold in 1998. I never thought about, you know, owning a baseball team again. It was a great 49-year-old ride um, for our family, but 14 months later, I was just curious, like, what does a baseball team look like today? And I got the book, and yeah, I was, I had no interest in really following through, but I got a little bit curious, and soon enough, I cut a deal to buy the team. 
I mean, I, I, it was the one deal in my life where I didn't care what the price was. And the way baseball teams are typically sold is they tell you this is the price. It's non-negotiable. And the first approvable party that can hit the price is going to get the deal. They told me I was approvable. And I'm like, yeah, but I can still negotiate, right? And, and, and the answer was absolutely not. So I knew I paid too much in 2012. I had no idea that I paid too little. The, the value of franchises has really gone up. Um, but was, what was driving me really was part about sports. And, um, and, you know, just I grew around loving the game of baseball. It was, you know, part of, part of our family. But by that time, I had bought a number of businesses. And, and that's, you know, if you do it well, it's economically rewarding. But it's just business. And, and with a sports franchise in a, in a proud city, you can have so much community impact. And that's, now I tell you what, we've got amazing people here that run the baseball side and the business side. And, you know, hopefully I give them the tools to be successful, but they run it. You know, the, the philosophy here is it's a family owned but professionally managed operation. And I, you know, we, we have really best in class people that um, run the show here day to day, but the rewards that come for making a difference in your community. And I'll just give the big headline here for me. Um, I've gotten very heavily involved to the point where I work on it almost daily and have weekly meetings and on the, on the issue of homelessness. And, you know, probably my, the proudest thing that um, those of us that work on homelessness in San Diego, while the problem is escalating dramatically in every city across the state, for us here, it's been steadily declining the past four years. Um, and the problem, of course, is complicated by the pandemic, but that, that's, you know, that is the really special thing about owning a sports franchise. First of all, it, if, if we win the World Series here, this city has never had a world championship and the Chargers moved. And, you know, like we're, we're the last man standing and like we really feel an obligation. We got it. We got to get that trophy. And I'll tell you this also, once we get one, we're going to get two um, and go from there. But um, I, I was going to refer to my notes. I tend to never do that. Let me just see if there's anything really relevant that I missed. Um, well, I tell you, you know, in, in the past couple of years, we pushed our payroll into the top 10 in Major League Baseball, and we're 28 out of 30 when it comes to media market, which has historically driven revenue. We decided let's, let's make the bet, you know, let's, and we got really good support from ticket buyers and sponsors. So what we've told the people down here is let us move first. We'll spend the money first, but we're counting on you to, you know, pay more uh, when we can sell tickets and, you know, what, what it's going to take to have a, to have a sponsor put their name on the outfield wall. It's going to be more, especially as we get better. And we, you know, so we'll, we probably lost a hundred million dollars real cash last year and same thing this year. Um, but that's okay. You know, um, aside from myself, there's, really three others, significant families that are kind of in it in the long haul for me. Um, and, and the way I structured it is consistent with the way I've always structured deals. If I'm gonna ask other people to put in money, I'm gonna put in at least two or three times what I ask you to put in. So if there's pain to be felt, you know, I'll feel it the most. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of financial pain in the past couple of years, but we think from an intermediate and long-term perspective, it'll, it'll really pay off. Um, so that's interesting to me. When you talk about starting out almost from the beginning, evaluating the, the value of companies, thinking about investing in companies, buying companies in the early 90s, all this stuff. And, you know, baseball is interesting because I think Assessing the value of a club or a player isn't as straightforward. Now, sometimes, of course, when it comes to companies, there's um, 
there are difficulties in terms of getting access to the right kinds of information. But I think, you know, the nature of sports has so much to do with timing and luck and also kind of the love and appreciation of the fans that you can't always know today that the investment is going to pay off tomorrow or five years from now or 10 years from now, what have you, right? Um, nevertheless, I, I suspect that um, that early training makes you, I think, really well positioned when you think about kind of how to make decisions at the owner level. You know, do you feel that way? And, and, and by the way, and do you feel that your time at Anderson helped with any of that? Yeah, I, I love my two years at Anderson. Um, you know, in my experience, the, the MBA program does a great job as it should bringing in a diverse class, um, in every way. Um, but I was a finance undergraduate and I was a finance grad student. So I will, in all honesty, tell you this, I skipped a fair amount of classes and played a lot of basketball at the Wooden Center <laughs> nice. and, and made, made a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. And um, because, you know, I had taken accounting, basic accounting and, and stuff like that. But also even, you know, back in the, in the late eighties, um, the teaching was tremendous. I learned a ton and the relationships um, are super valuable. You know, I always try to honor that if somebody from the, you know, that's a UCLA grad, um, you know, uh, finds me by email or otherwise, uh, you know, there's that special tie there. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like, you know, it gets into your blood, right? And I grew up, um, I, you know, it's a little anecdotal story, but when I was in high school, Bill Walton was at UCLA. And I know the class here is quite young, but if you take a look at Bill Walton's pictures or photos at UCLA or even in his early career at, um, at Portland, I mean, he was just my favorite player. So uh, mm -hmm. dynamic, a little bit controversial, had a remarkable relationship with Coach Wooden, who are cut from two different cloths. Um, but fast forward, um, Bill is a San Diego and one of the great ones, uh, a very charitable person. And like, that's, you know, the other really cool thing about being involved in pro sports, you know, Bill's a good friend right now. And I can't believe I can say that. Um, <laughs> but um, he is heart and soul San Diego. Um, so yeah, this, um, this stuff gets in your blood in a lot of ways, but the educational experience and the relationships you meet um, and I would weigh them equally, um, you know, just the exposure to different kinds of people to, you know, in my case, like studying, you know, like when it gets to the advanced finance classes where there's calculus involved, well, I'm in the class with an engineer. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And the <laughs> engineer's like, oh yeah, no problem. Right, right, so, right. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, you know, and, and plus growing up in, in uh, Pasadena, um, or in anywhere in LA, you either love or hate UCLA or love or hate USC. I was all UCLA as a kid and still <laughs> to this day. So, and I, I'm sure there are some students on this call that maybe went to UCLA or USC undergrad and now are here. Your, your blood better be turning blue. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, no, I, I think, you know, and I, I have some, you know, recollections also right I, I got my MBA here at Anderson too and I remember being in classes you know we had a quantitative market research class where we were working on um, adoption models diffusion models um, and kind of customer lifetime value and we had some equations that we were learning and so on and I remember you, you talk about engineers um, one of my favorite classmates uh, at the time was you know, was a brilliant young woman, Latina, went to an elite undergrad school um, and had worked for Northrop Grumman, yeah. right? So she's literally a rocket scientist and the <laughs> instructor is walking through one of these, you know, formulas or whatever. And he says, it's not rocket science. And I look over at her and she's like, what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think 
one of the things that I've always loved about Anderson is the academic rigor for sure. And, and um, it's a calling card. And I think one of the things that we can, you know, spans generations, you know, um, I've probably got at this point, um, 15 years on the crop that's going through Anderson now. And um, all of us, I think, you know, when people know that you got your MBA from Anderson, there's a certain quantitative fluency that I think people expect you to have. Now that is not the same thing as being a spreadsheet jockey, right? Some people go in that direction. Some people are really kind of either financial services oriented or business strategy, business modeling type stuff and other people are not. But the idea that you can kind of take a problem, distill it to the numbers and find answers in the numbers, that's a thing that I think most Anderson people can do. And I'm glad that um, you got to have that experience and I'm glad that you still have some connection with some of the students that came through, particularly some of the notables. <laughs> you know, Walton, um, huh? And a lot of that, um, like one of the things that we talk about in our private equity firm is, you know, if, if you know, we exit a deal and it's been a great deal, you know, we, we, we celebrate for a night, but you have to get better you know, not just every year, but every month, because the business world changes so fast. And the minute you think you're good at it, you're not, because it's different next month. And um, what, what's really different today versus when I graduated in 88 is there's so many more analytical tools available. You know, with the Padres here, we have a whole department for analytics on the baseball side and a separate department for analytics on the business side. Like we know vision, how to price tickets on a Tuesday night against Colorado versus on a Saturday night against LA. And it's, it's light years apart. And, uh, you know, going back to when I was first looking at the materials on the Padres, I was stunned how different it is. But 2012 to 2015, there were further massive changes. And, um, and there will be going forward, you know, our, a lot of our revenue uh, for all the clubs comes in from uh, the regional sports networks. Media rights, that, right. that period is, is if it's not over, it's darn near over because everybody streams and it's a big struggle in baseball now with the RSN revenue declining. How do we capture revenue off of streaming off of, you know, YouTube, FaceTime, Amazon, all these things that I don't understand. Um, but, you know, we, and it's of course, just like one month, one year at a time, because none of the sports yet are really monetizing off of that. Football is probably ahead of us. Um, and it's in, but the other thing that's happening fast is, uh, you know, speaking of analytics, baseball really lends itself to sports, gaming and gambling. I mean, there's 162 games and you can do all these. You know, I'm not a fan of gambling for different reasons, but um, it's real. Can't change the, you know, can't change what's real. And um, that is something that's going to be, I think, completely different two, three years from now than it is today. Like you're going to be watching games on however you consume it on your iPhones or on television or whatever. And if you want, you know, you can you know, bet five bucks on whether the next pitch is a strike or a ball or, you know, take the odds on who's going to hit the first double of the game. You know, it's endless what the possibilities are. And it seems that the trends, uh, I think all the states are going to legalize it because of revenue shortages, you know, like, like what happened with lotteries, but um, things really move fast and really no decisions now are made without heavy influence from analytics. Our organization probably relies, especially on the baseball side, less on, less on analytics than maybe almost everybody. Because, you know, when, when a scout goes to see a baseball player, he's studying, you know, giving him a grade on speed and defense and mm -hmm. arm strength and all these things. And then on the other side of the scouting cards are character things. And our group and myself included really believes in the character things. Like we gave Manny Machado a 10 year guaranteed $300 million deal. Despite the fact that his reputation was kind of a bad character guy, he's not. 
you know, so far we've had two great years then. We got eight, you know, knock on wood, we got eight more years to go. We won't do many 10 year deals. Um, it's just, you know, they're, they're guaranteed, whereas a football deal is not guaranteed. Um, but th those, you know, those are big, big commitments when you do. And our, um, but analytics informs everything. And then where we, you know, draw the line is really on character. Um, in the case of Manny, you know, we, we got to know him. He loves the game. We knew his background. He comes from a very poor community in South Miami. And he just was born a great baseball player. But he was also born a neighborhood kid where if you push him, he's going to push you back twice as hard. We respect that. And that's uh, he's, he's been terrific for us. Um, but, you know, um, when, when we do our diligence on a player, it's relentless. And really, most of the clubs are pretty relentless. Um, but you find like little league teammates and high school coaches and oh, so that no, no, that's, that's you, private you, equity level research right there. When you start getting into the little league teammates, <laughs> that's not you know your regular due diligence. That's you know we're going in, but that's great. And, yeah. I, and I think that you know, and it's funny because I do see right now a dynamic tension between people who really believe in analytics, particularly advanced scouting type um, metrics and KPIs versus the eyeball test versus, you know, kind of character. You know, there's the whole debate as to whether or not there's a such thing as being clutch. Yeah. And I believe there is, right? It's like, well, the numbers don't say it. the numbers say that it's like, no, I think human nature is such that under pressure, people perform differently. Folks who can deliver in those situations, that's character. It's not just about consistency, yeah. right? Being able to be consistent in tough situations is the definition of clutch, right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, I think it's, it, you know, this is going to be, um, you know, you mentioned on the business side as well. We can talk about that a little bit, but like the, I think the conversation is not finished. You know, it's true that a long time ago, you know, 20 years ago or so, we were having this debate between stats versus your gut. Um, but I think now with the measurement tools, sensors, and all this other stuff that we have, you can give somebody a bionic gut. That is to say, like I can take somebody who has the talent to, you know, has the ability to evaluate talent and give them some tools so they can make better decisions as opposed to feeling like, the, you know, those two things have to be separate. Yeah. And still, we are still going to run into situations where, you know, one organization values a player um, or a group of players in one way and another organization evaluates them differently. And I think that's one of the things that makes the game interesting. Um, do you feel like, because I know that you said earlier that you you know kind of family owned, professionally run. Do you feel like your role as an owner has evolved? Do you feel like the approach of your management team has evolved since you bought the franchise, um, or do you see this more as kind of like you had a vision when you purchased the club and you're still kind of just building that out? Yeah, I had a vision um, when my partners and I bought the club. And that was, I, I was in the middle of chemotherapy when I cut the deal. Like, you know, I- It happened that I fast. weighed 120 some odd pounds and had no hair. I mean, chemo, chemo takes a lot out of you. But like I said, at some point, like, I just thought it was really special. I thought, you know, families around San Diego, we're gonna change how they view the Padres. You know, kind of the, the cannot do Padres. Well, we can't spend any money or, you know, and, uh, but I had to take care of myself and, and I still had a lot of commitments in, in my private equity firm. So I asked um, a local uh, big sports guy named Ron Fowler to, to chair in the beginning um, with, you know, and, and our kind of intent was three, four years. And then two or three years in, I got cancer again, same thing came back. Um, and so I was out of pocket really for 18 months other than, you know, by phone. So, but step by step, I, you know, in my gut, I would have made some changes faster, but, you know, I had to honor like this guy was terrific and I, you know, he's got to do it his way. And by and large, our ways were 90% completely aligned. And then, you know, I would tweak it, you know, like what I'm doing now is tweaking it my 10% and, 
um, but it, it was a great long-term relationship. He's still a, a small owner in the club, but, um, you know, I, I thought we could really transform this team. And when Ron and I would meet with the management, we knew it was a disaster when we bought it. It was really poorly managed. Um, it was, you know, the guy that I bought it from, John Moores, I look at as the best owner in Padres history. So, I mean, he was passionate about the team. He, um, he and the, the legendary Larry Lachino as his CEO mm -hmm. built the team that went to the World Series in 98, got swept mm -hmm. by the Yankees, Evan Brown. The great Derek Jeter Yankees. And, um, but, you know, then again, like life intervenes, you know, John went through a divorce. It was ugly. He had a problem with one of his company. I mean, this is all well documented in, in San Diego. And he just, you know, had to get out of it. You know, he, he loved the team, but he had to sell it. And for the last, you know, a couple of years, it was really floundering. And we knew we were buying something that needed to be fixed. But almost always, you know, when we, in my private equity experience, when we buy a company, first of all, we, we, we typically only buy it if we love the existing management. But, you know, we always give them all a chance, right? Um, we're here to support you. There's a few things we ask for, you know, if it's something significant, tell us about it immediately. We don't need good news today, but if it's bad news, I want it today because it might get worse tomorrow. You know, just stuff like that. Honesty, transparency, collaboration. Um, I mean, we, we were using those words before they were popular. <laughs> Culture. <laughs> now everybody says it. Um, but of course, I probably learned it from somebody else like we all do. Um, but the executives that we inherited, they were just can't do. What do you mean we can sign a free agent? We don't have the revenue to do it. And part of it is just, you know, the kind of the business and baseball cycle with a sports organization. The more you win, the bigger your revenue. The bigger your revenue, the more you can spend on winning. And you want that, you know, and that I think is exactly. we're close to having that now the way I envisioned it. And we're really impactful in the community on, you know, our we do a massive uh, cancer bike ride every year that raises millions and we give it to local researchers. Researchers, I, I mentioned homelessness. Youth sports is a huge part of what we do. Every little league team throughout the county, it's Padres against Padres with different vintage uniforms. So every mm -hmm. kid growing up, you know, what we're trying to do now is build a generation of passionate fans. And you only do that by winning. Uh, up until last year, the franchise has existed for 51 years and been to the postseason five times. I don't think you can find a worse track record in any of the major sports. Maybe, maybe the Cleveland Browns or somebody, I don't know. Um, and, you know, our aspiration is to completely change that to, you know, this decade to make the postseason seven, eight, nine, ten times. And I think we're set up to do it. We have a good major league club. We have a great minor league system. Um, so I'm, um, I'm rambling. I'll oh, no, I love it. And, and, and <laughs> this is, again, this baseball fan you're talking to. I think that there are, um, again, he assuming health and all these other things, there are things that you can put into place that make a team sustainable. And I take your point about, you know, we talk about market size when market size also depends on the perception of the brand of the organization, the combination of the culture and the success on the field and what people feel, how you make people feel, right? Um, you can be in a small, look at St. Louis. St. Louis is not a giant media market, Yeah. right? That's, so that's, that's probably my number one model and they've built it over decades. You know, we're not going to get to of their course. level of passion in that city, but we can. Yes, it, it, yes. And so I would ask you then, because we've, we've been talking a lot about kind of on the field and the investments on the field, you mentioned the kind of scouting and, and how you evaluate talent. What about the, on the business side when you talk about using analytics on the business side? Because I feel like the other piece of this is not, it's not, of course, if, if you have a better team, there's more passion. If you invest in the community, there's more passion. But to get the most out of those investments, I'm assuming 
you're measuring something. Plus you have a very unique situation because down in San Diego, you have a multicultural market. You're yeah. talking about, you know, you're, you're the, the franchise farthest south, closest to Mexico. So yeah. like, how, how does Our that name inform is the, the Padres, you know, we right. have a Mexican last name. Uh, so, so how does, so how does, how do you use data to figure out how to connect with these fans and energize them? Yeah, we, we do that effectively. Um, but we're in the early stages of doing it. You know, that's, uh, again, something that um, I think myself and our president of business are really driving to the next level right now. So one of the things we did this off season is we signed the best player from the Korean league, a kid named Husan Kim. And he, he, I think the rules are after you play in either the Korean league or the Japanese league, after five years, you can, your team can post you and make you available to the major league. So we outbid everybody else for this kid because there's always, um, and we think we got a bargain, but people are generally afraid to sign, you know, the Korean league is triple A level or maybe a little bit above. Right. It's not generally major league level, but this kid is 26. He's been the best player in the league for the last four or five years. He's got all the personality in the world. I think he um, pretty much guaranteed a world championship for us this year in his first press conference. Um, but I, I um, somebody emailed me just a couple of days ago, Jay, I'll send it to you. Um, an article from a Korean sports publication that said, you know, back in the, I think it was in the nineties, the Dodgers signed the rock star baseball player, Chan Ho Park. He was the first big time Korean player to come here. And the Dodgers historically have been Korea's team. And then the article talked about the Padres and Fernando Tatis and the fact that we signed Kim and the players want to play here. Um, and it said, we honor the history of LA, but um, the Padres are the present and the Padres are the future. Now that was one article, but it sure, sure as heck made me feel good. But we are um, with, with a, a big dose of energy reaching out to the, uh, the relevant companies in Korea to become our sponsors and we'll, we'll have success there. The same thing this year in Japan because we signed Yu Darvish, who's mm -hmm. you know already a historic uh, player from Japan, and also another like we honor players' personalities. Be yourself. Be comfortable in your own skin. You want to have crazy hair or um, flip bats or be controversial. Be yourself. And if you want to be the quiet guy that shows up and works hard, be that guy too. Um, that's our culture. You know, as opposed to, you know, a couple of the more traditional franchise where we want you to be clean shaven and you know, the Yankees are the big example of that. And again, it goes back to like, you know, we're a crazy wild animal in the jungle and the Yankees are the biggest, strongest animal in the jungle. So we hope we play them. <laughs> we'll see right. what happens. Right. That'll be fun. Yeah. Right? But, but business analytics, you know, San Diego's by far biggest uh, minority community is Hispanic. And we have not done a great job engaging with them. Um, and, and this is really among the first years that we're, you know, reaching out, we're giving, you know, free tickets to, you know, elementary schools and high schools, same thing in the black community. We really have a burgeoning Korean community here, nothing like the size of what, what, it, what it is in LA. Right. Um, the first thing I noticed, so I hadn't been to Petco until I was trying to buy the deal. And I went down for a game, I walked around, and said, Padres are losing. Everybody's happy because the food and drink and the climate is good. And it was pretty darn old demographically and it was pretty darn white. And I know you don't see that at Dodger Stadium. You might have in, in the early 60s, but we, you know, it was clear. It was, you know, it was just the eyeball test. And, um, you know, baseball overall needs to do a much, much better job. And, you know, there's some programs in place just bringing the game to anybody and everybody, boys and girls. And the research shows if your mom or dad takes you to the game when you're six, you're pretty much going to be a fan for life. And separately, but if 
if you play a diamond sport, even if it's kickball, but particularly, you know, youth baseball, baseball softball. softball. And but what I mentioned about the little leagues, we, we do exactly the same thing for all the softball leagues. Um, you know, this is no seeker, but we do a terrible job of um, bringing up female executives in the sport, both on the baseball and the business side. And um, it, it's a commit, you know, with, with all the social issues that have happened in the past year, it, you know, we've taken it to the next level, but we were, we were pretty much moving fast in that direction already. Um, and, you know, all of our kind of hiring and, um, um, you know, just how our organization's built. Like I, I, I want to walk, our office still, you walk through and it's, it's, um, it's very young first and foremost, you know, there's a lot of skilled 20 somethings in the office, but it's still too white. And, and it's certainly not brown enough when you, when you talk about um, how many, you know, really skilled Hispanics there are in this market. Um, and I think within diversity adds to an organization period and uh, baseball's baseball's learning that I, I think there's a bigger commitment that needs to come from the commissioner's office and it's kind of in my opinion it's moving in that direction i'd like to see it move more quickly so it's it's funny and oh by the way folks who are participating you'll notice at the bottom of your screen there is a button that says q a if you have a question you would like us to bring up please click on that button and type your question. Um, I should have mentioned that at the top of the conversation, but please feel free to jump in and join in with your questions. Um, you know, the points you made, Peter, about um, culture of the team, I think that's, from what I've observed, an issue that needs to be addressed league-wide. I think one of the things that we can do to get more young people excited um, about what they see is to give the players the freedom to celebrate and enjoy their performances on the field the way they see fit. Unfortunately, the culture of baseball has always had an element of kind of workmanlike, you know, be about your business. But after this kind of infusion of real like excitement and, and zany characters that we saw in the 70s and 80s, you saw this kind of this cultural shift all the way back in another direction in the 90s and early 2000s. I think one of the things that we see that's true for your club, um, but not true for a lot of, in, of, of MLB franchises, you know, we see players wanting to express themselves. And, you know, you got clubs like yours where like folks can wear their hair how they want to, perform on the field how they want to, celebrate how they want to. And other clubs where like, you know, you look at the ball, you hit too long and you're gonna have a ball in your ear or on your hip <laughs> the next time you come up to the plate, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, and, and the, um, the idea of having an organization where you have lots of different cultures coming together, working together to make a team successful, those are things that people will point out because they're coming from neighborhoods and situations where they can say, well, look, where we come from, you play this way, such as this is how we celebrate. Um, whereas that's not always obvious to folks across the league and in every organization. And I think that's, you know, the kind of the outreach in the community, having the, the, the a diverse array of personnel in the organization, um, all those things contribute to making a club a great place to be. And the weather doesn't hurt, right? So, you yeah. know, my, my hope for you is that, you know, folks want to come and play in San Diego. And if, if the last few years are any indication, they really do. Yeah, it, it, it's, this is really the first off season where players are calling us. Agents do not like players to call their general, you know, we, we, I mentioned where we started in 2012. We just ha had a general manager who was very competent and a good guy, but it was just too ingrained in him that we, we can't spend money. You know, we can't be aggressive. We have to stay in our lane. And so we, we replaced him, did a search and landed on AJ Preller basically because we thought he was the best player evaluator we could find. His work ethic is legendary and his passion to win is off the charts. What I didn't see in the interviews, which I know now, is he absolutely loves diversity. And he, you know, he went to, um, 
one of the Ivy League schools, I forget, and decided he didn't want to go to law school or whatever. He put on some boots and went down to the Dominican Republic and scouted baseball players and learned the language. And um, he's still only in his early 40s, but almost every player in baseball, almost every single one he met through his scouting activities. Uh, I forget the number of miles per year he would fly, but he'd be at a you know, uh, high school tournament in Alabama one week and the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Cuba, Japan, Korea. And it's a reflection in our dugout. You know, we, I think you Darvish is the best player from Japan in the league right now. The kid I was talking about from Korea, mm -hmm. uh, Tatis from the DR. We've got stars from Venezuela. Um, we, we traded a great young pitcher uh, to get Blake Snell and he's from Panama. So um, and they all love it. I, I mentioned Machado style, Hosmer's mm -hmm. style is, is different, but they really all have fun. They like each other and the words throughout baseball. So, um, it's tough when you got a guy calling and saying, you know, can you offer me a contract? I'll take less because I want to be a part of it. Or, you know, just give me a one year deal. Let me show you how good I am. Um, and, uh, you know, really all, all credit to AJ and his people for making that happen. Love it. Love it. All right. So I see now some folks are piping in questions, in, including one of my favorite professors. So Professor Abe, can you unmute yourself? I see you've got a question. Well, I guess we can't hear him. I'll read the question for him. Um, Dave Roberts, coach of the Dodgers is on the competition committee for Major League Baseball. Among their charters is to catch up with football and NBA on promotion of the sport. Do you agree? If so, how would baseball catch up with the other sports? What do they need to do? So, um, I could go in all kinds of directions, Professor Abe. I will start by saying Dave is one of my best friends in the game. Um, he yeah. is just as authentic and smart and he was a coach um, when we bought the team here and we elected not to interview him for our manager position. I wish I knew then what I knew now, um, but he got put in a box, works hard, nice guy, team player. No, nobody started with a natural leader, which he is. And I didn't know enough now to, you know, it was a, um, a previous CEO that was running the process, but Dave and I have stayed friends. Um, he, he's a San Diegan, aside from being a great, you know, dual athlete at UCLA. But um, his influence on the competition committee is really important, or, and more guys like him. Um, you know, the, the trickiest thing about baseball now is everything that the owners do by and large, especially when it relates to rules of the game and stuff needs to be negotiated with the players union. And there's just distrust, mistrust, like I've never seen before between both sides. And I think, you know, myself and a few of the owners that think it's crazy and a few agents and people on the, um, on the players union side are trying to build bridges because part of the reason that, you know, the NBA is so popular is that there's trust. People trust Adam Silver. And I think the world of Commissioner Manfred, but um, the tricky thing is he grew up as baseball's labor lawyer. He, he's as skilled a labor lawyer as anybody. And there were times when, you know, the owners tell him what to do. He'll, he'll do whatever we ask, you know, I'm glad, you know, and I think last year we had a really messy negotiation with the players because Manfred delegated more than I would like to see him delegate. And I think right now he's leading, he's focused. Um, he knows what's practical. He knows where, de where deals can be made. And I think, he's going to be constructive and, you know, it's going to take time, but starting to build bridges, but everything like, you know, if we want to eliminate the shift or change the extra inning rules, um, 
Go ahead. What was that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Go oh, ahead, okay. Professor Abe. Go ahead. No, I designated a hitter. In the oh, next the, the DH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All those so, things are on the table, right? So starting with a uh, runner on base in extra innings, uh, making putting a de designated hitter in the National League, a bunch of ideas that have been floated over the last couple of years, and they all have to be collectively bargained. And the problem is both sides want the DH, but the players want it more. So our side, I think, foolishly doesn't just agree to that because we want something traded back. In the same context, as owners, we really want the expanded postseason. And the players really want it too, but they know we want it more. So, and then there's, you know, 10 or 12 secondary issues. And there's so much lack of trust that the negotiations are really frustrating. Fortunately, I'm not in the middle of it. I'm not on the labor committee. Um, but I do think there is a path forward to make things better. You know, the more people like Dave Roberts, um, Chris Young, who uh, now is the general manager of Texas, used to, used to be the kind of um, bridge builder in the commissioner's office of the players union. There's a lot of really good people in the game, some former players. Some, I have a lot of respect for some of the owners that really do constructive work. Um, but that's the tricky part about it. It's just, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, four of us sitting in a room saying, hey, what's fair, we'd get it done in an afternoon. It doesn't work that way. Right. right. So um, next question was uh, from Justin Barker. Justin, can you hear us? Justin, okay. there we go. Yeah. Um, go. Go ahead and ask your question. So I understand that the future of uh, Padres is currently very bright and they have done very well in terms of trading, uh, signing the free agents and drafting very well. But how much input as an owner do you have in terms of the direction of the team, how does you proceed? So here's how I look at it uh, on the baseball side. I give our general manager a three-year budget. I said, look, if you spend more this year, which you can, you have to make it up, you know, the next year, the next year. So, and, and um, I'm very well known inside these walls to be very flexible and, and our budgets get updated, right? If, um, you know, we budget total revenue on the business side and if we go 10 million over that, which we very well could this year, that goes right into the baseball budget. So um, I'm not a micromanager. You know, when, when AJ calls me and said, I think, you know, I think I can make a deal for Blake Snell, but it's going to cost us some, some prospects, the best of which is, um, oh, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, well, um, it'll come to me, but in any event, I question him on that because ultimately I want, I think sports organizations become great when they have homegrown talent primarily that the fans can relate to and get attached to. Um, and, you know, we hope Tatis will spend his career with us. I know he'd like to also, um, you know, the way Tony Gwynn did, but the Padres do not have a great history of doing that. And I think we are ultimately going to be largely a homegrown organization and AJ has a budget. He'll factor that into, you know, trades and free agent signings. Um, but, you know, both of us agree, it's going to be very rare when we trade uh, one of our top 10 prospects, because we're very good at finding young players, we're very good at developing them. And the last thing I want to do, you know, our number one prospect now is a pitcher named Mackenzie Gore. He's off limits. I do not want to see Mackenzie Gore have a 15 year all star maybe Hall of Fame career with, you know, some other team with, with the evil New York Mets, Jay. Hey, watch it now. <laughs> but you know, we, we run it like any other business. They have a budget. If something's going wrong, again, I ask for you know, tell me on day one when something seems to be steering in the wrong direction. And I think our guys respond best to that. They know I trust them. I've known them all for a long time. Now you know, four or five years at minimum for most of our top people. 
and we really have good stability. We've got trust at different levels and, um, you know, I, I'd rather uh, spend uh, my evenings on the couch watching cartoons with my kids than worry about whether we're paying, you know, 9.5 million or 9.8 million a year for a player. That's what, that's why, you know, that's why the experts in baseball operations are there. Not every owner behaves that way, by the way, you know, some of them just love the back and forth and the nuance and exerting their will, which in my view is almost always a real bad mistake. So it's interesting because you brought up, I think two, very interesting topics that we, you know, we're going to end up running over time talking about them. But the, the first is this issue around scouting and development. I think a lot of organizations are decent at scouting. That is to say, just identifying guys who have the, the physical tools, as well as the, the skill and the acumen to perform on the field. But it's a long way from having talent to being able to be successful at the major league level. And that requires some intervention, coaches, um, experiences, time on the field, all that stuff. And some teams seem to be really good at taking their own players and turn them into guys who can really make an impact at the major league level. And other teams just can't do it, right? That, you know, they can develop players who will ultimately go on to play someplace else, or they can manage players that have already been developed, but they can't both kind of get yeah. those players to a level and then have them perform for their team. Like for you, what's what's the secret sauce? How do you get these kids to stay uh, and thrive? Well, we haven't proven we have the secret sauce by any stretch, but uh, to me, a big part of it is patience. You know, these are all very young men. Uh, most of them have, uh, well, most of them from this country have lived a pretty entitled life where, you know, everybody caters to them from the time they're in Little League. Mm. And, um, you know, they're young and they're immature like, you know, all of us were when we were 16, 18, 20, whatever years old. So we try to provide them with stability, with kind of good life coaching and be patient. You know, the, the Hall of Fame is full of players who were great at 19, bad at 20 and 21, and then found their stride at 20, you know, in 2022. And we've got to be patient with those players, you know, and, and Frankly, we've got to be more patient with those players um, than even we have been in the past. So, you know, my hope is that this is probably the last offseason. We'll, we'll make a flurry of trades. But ultimately, we were able to do that because we have a really deep minor league system, great coaches, great players. And we, we really traded from the middle of the pack guys that we thought were good would get attention, but maybe didn't have such a high ceiling, but patience is a big part of it. And, you know, sports is funny. If a general manager has a year or two left on his contract, sometimes they get desperate because they better win right now. Or they're going to be fired. And, um, you know, we have to prove it out, but I think the two top executives here, the only two that report to me, one on business, one on baseball, know that I expect them to be here for the next 20 years. And, you know, again, I go back to all I ask of them is, you know, I, I want the continuity, but it's got to be combined with excellence. And these guys don't need to hear from me. They're just wired that way. Yeah. And that brings me to the second piece of this, which is also kind of in the string of questions I'm looking at, which is around competitive balance, which is to say, you know, I love what you've done with the franchise, with the culture, with the players. Um, that's not the story for some teams in MLB. Some teams have been kind of struggling perennially for a number of years. And other teams seem to be kind of always in the playoff hunt for a number of years. Um, do you feel like uh, there are any structural things, whether it's incentives, um, salary cap structure, revenue sharing, the schedule, um, the way the divisions are broken out, like realignment, is there anything that could be done within the sport that would lead to kind of more uncertainty and more competitive balance? Yeah, I, I think baseball's in a better position than it ever has been as it relates to competitive balance because we have a, um, 
a revenue so a, a revenue sharing program that evens it up to some extent. Um, you know, every situation is a little bit different. The Dodgers will always have massively more money because their television contract yeah. is is massive. They they hit the the RSN deal at the right time at the right moment, and there were reasons that um, Time Warner where, where they just massively overbid Fox to get the deal and it turned into a great guaranteed deal for LA and it really caused Time Warner to get out of that business um, you know their top executive made a really bad decision and there's a whole story there but I think step by step we're moving in the right direction um, Jay like you and I were talking earlier you know, if the Yankees signed Garrett Cole to the big contract that they did and he doesn't work out, he breaks his elbow or whatever, they can cover it up with money, no problem. Yep. Uh, but there's not that many teams that can do that. And, you know, um, so, it, and, you know, I, I think there are some great, great owners in sports. And then, you know, I think there are some just really egocentric folks that, that make mistakes. Um, I mean, I have a ton of respect for most of the other owners in baseball, but not all of them. And um, I, I think competitive, I mean, we're showing we're the 28th largest media market and we're in the top 10 in payroll and we can make economic sense out of it. So, you know, it, it takes skill managing. Um, but I, I think Looking forward, we'll probably end up, you know, 10 years from now, we have 30 clubs right now. I would guess we have 32. We, we're set up a lot the way football is. 32, we have eight um, divisions of four teams each. And um, we have a much bigger playoff format where, you know, probably we'll land on 14 teams make the playoffs every year. There's advantages to the teams with the best record. So you incentivize even those at the top to keep on winning. And I think that'll be healthy to grow the game along with the stuff, Jay, that um, you mentioned as far as let the players be players, let the young kids be young kids. Let's get the nine-year-olds thinking it's more cool to be Fernando Tatis than it is to be Pat Mahomes or, you know, Kevin Durant. Right. That's right. That's right. I love it. I love it. Um, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, and as I said, when we started this conversation, I could talk baseball all day. But with all the stuff you've got going on, I want to let you get back to the rest of your life and that amazing family. So <laughs> Peter, thank you, thank you, thank you for spending some time with us. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, Bruin for life and can't wait to meet you in person when uh, you know, uh, pandemic circumstances allow it. And we wish you, your family, San Diego community and the Padres continued success. Um, and, and we'll see you on the flip side. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Jay. And maybe my parting shot to all the students on the call is the sports industry is massive. And for those with an interest, just get your foot in the door because the, you know, um, you got to be prepared to work extremely hard. Generally, it's not glamorous, even for the people that are down video and the players and stuff, but it's a great career. If you, if you really love sports and whether it's on the media side or the club side or, you know, even working for the players, you know, whatever, like it's really interesting. It's the most interesting business I've been around. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned before, you can really have a positive impact in your community like nothing else. So if I can help anybody, um, Jay can tell you how to find me. Outstanding. And I might, I might for tickets. Anyway, uh -huh. with that, <laughs> with that in mind, ladies and gents, um, you know, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Um, but if you have questions and comments about baseball and about the Padres, you know how to find me and I'll make sure that we get those questions along to Peter. So thank you for joining us. Have a great night. Um, and thanks again, Peter. Mm -hmm.